a minute. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today as we talk about the science behind COVID-19, uh, the, the dreaded virus that has really transformed uh, all of our lives uh, for the last several months. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please submit them using the Q&A button at the bottom of the webinar, and we're going to get to as many as we can. Uh, we have been incredibly inspired to see the scientific community come together with uh, remarkable speed and determination to understand what this virus is, how it harms our bodies, and find new treatments and, uh, and, and ultimately a vaccine. Uh, Dr. Scott Noggle, who heads up research at NICEF, uh, is going to give an overview of what we've learned in a few months of uh, studying this virus and also discuss the approach that we're taking at NICEF um, and why we're taking this approach uh, to help tackle COVID-19. Um, we are passionate uh, about working on COVID-19 because our mission is to be able to use the incredible um, technology and biology of stem cell research to accelerate cures uh, for the major diseases of our time. Uh, and COVID-19 uh, undeniably has burst into that category. There are so many critical challenges, but I'm, I am truly uh, optimistic, I think in a very realistic way, um, that uh, with the world's brightest minds uh, working on this, we're going to have real solutions. Uh, and I believe we're also going to have uh, uh, reliable um, and quick uh, tests uh, this summer. So before we get started, I also want to thank our colleagues at the Stavros Niarchos Foundation uh, and other supporters of our education and outreach efforts um, for allowing us to uh, provide uh, today's uh, webinar. While the pandemic has uh, undoubtedly changed the nature of how we're convening, uh, you know, certainly for, um, for the next few months, um, we are really happy to be able to continue sharing the latest science uh, with our community. So it is now my, um, my great pleasure to introduce my longtime colleague, uh, Scott Noggle. Scott joined us in 2008 um, and is Senior Vice President of Research at NICEF and uh, he is a developmental biologist uh, by training um, and is overseeing our efforts on COVID-19. So, Scott. All right. Thank you, Susan. So, yeah, so what I thought I'd do today is take, um, take you guys through um, a bit of the background and biology of the COVID-19 pandemic and the virus that, that, that's actually causing this pandemic. Um, the screen that you see here is a, a electron microscopy image of uh, you know, several hundred different little viral particles attached to the surface of a cell. So this is not pollen. Um, it's actually little um, balls uh, that are each individual one is, is, is an individual virus. They're, less, you know, you, you can fit many, many thousands of these across the, he the head of a pin. They're very, very tiny. And it takes, you know, really high-powered microscopes to actually be able to even, to even see these viruses. I think they were first imaged and seen in the 1960s. Um, and, you know, our knowledge of, of virology and, and of coronaviruses and the family of viruses that's causing this current pandemic um, is, uh, has, has grown quite a bit over the years. And, you know, I think uh, a lot of the research that has taken place in the past on different types of coronaviruses has set up the research community to be able to react quickly to actually being able to um, develop strategies for um, diagnosing, uh, hopefully treating, and ultimately preventing the disease with, with vaccines and, and, and other approaches. Um, but this little virus is, uh, it, it, viruses are sort of unique little um, uh, biological entities. They're little machines that almost their sole purpose is to be able to re recreate and replicate copies of themselves. So if you zoom in to one of these little balls of, of uh, the, the virus, it, it might look something like this sort of in 3D. It's, a, it's almost like a little ball, a little tennis ball maybe that has um, lots of different proteins and molecules sort of decorating its surface. Um, and the, the, the virus uses uh, these, these molecules to be able to, to attach to cells and, and find their way, you know, make their way into your cell. Um, but the virus needs your cell to actually replicate and make more of itself. It can't do it on its own and it has to um, co-opt all of the different machinery in, inside your cells to be able to replicate and make more of itself. Um, and to do this, it, 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 it's a little machine that, that has 
um, different molecules that enable it to gain entry into your cell um, and then start to use the different molecules inside your cell to, to start copying itself and making lots and lots of copies of itself. So one of these viruses um, looks like this if we look, like, look at it in sort of a diagram, a cartoon view. So you have the outside, if you cut through the middle of this virus, you see the, the, the gray ring that, that is the membrane that encloses the um, contents inside the virus. And then in that membrane, there are different receptors, these red molecules on the outside and other, other proteins and molecules that, that help the virus um, gain entry into the cells. The sort of string of beads, the purple, blue, blue purple um, and gray string of beads that you see um, sort of wound up inside the virus is the virus's genome. That contains all of the information that the virus needs to make all of the components of the virus, but also co-opt the cell's um, inner workings to, to, to accomplish that. Um, so we talk about the spike proteins. These are the red proteins on the outside of the, the virus that uh, um, that latch on to receptors onto different cells. And then there's other proteins um, that uh, package up this uh, viral genome. This, has this, um, this type of virus has a RNA um, strand that's about um, 30 kilobases long, so 30 letter, 30, 30, 000 letters long, sorry. Um, and that, that is wrapped up using this nucleocapsid proteins and packaged and squeezed in, inside of these little viral particles. Um, so, this virus is sort of interesting because it's transmitted by um, through the respiratory system, through your nose and mouth and down into your trachea and, and into your lungs. And it, you, the virus uses this spike protein on the outside of the virus to bind, uh, bind receptors, basically handles on the outside of cells that allow the virus to sort of latch on to a cell um, and then eventually gain entry into the cell. And this receptor is found on a lot of different types of cells. It's found on cells inside your, inside your nose, inside your uh, mouth, down your throat. Um, it's also found all throughout the lungs uh, in different cell types throughout the lungs. Um, but it's also found on a lot of other cell types in the body and a lot of other tissues in the body. So, um, so when somebody sneezes, for example, that has the virus and, and is close by, um, you might breathe in that virus through through your nose or through your mouth and and take in the virus um, in into your lungs and you know the virus will um, infect cells in in you know anywhere up and down up and down the uh, up and down the lung initially um, and the uh, the virus once it gains entry in the lung will start to replicate itself and 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 shed shed viruses into um, other areas of the body that uh, that that might themselves also have the receptors for um, for the, for the virus and, and gain entry. Um, so we're still learning a lot about which types of cells and tissues um, that the virus is actually able to infect and which ones that it actually does infect. So not all tissues that actually express the receptor might actually. Um, uh, come in contact with the virus and uh, some of those tissues might even be protected from the immune system. And we're learning a lot about um, how the biology of this virus works once it's inside our, once it's inside our bodies. But initially it gains entry um, usually through, through the respiratory tract, through the nose and, and mouth and, and down, in, down into the lungs. Um, and this is part of the reason behind uh, um, some of the measures that, that have been recommended to be put in place to try to block spread from one person to the other. Um, so a lot of studies are starting to point to the idea that the um, respiratory droplets, the little droplets and particles that um, come out of your mouth when you sneeze, when you cough, um, even when you're talking or singing or, you know, or, or really vocalizing loudly, um, you, you skewed sort of larger droplets and smaller droplets. And each one of these droplets can have thousands to millions of, of viral particles that, that are in, in, uh, you know, contained in those droplets. And as you sneeze and you know, release those droplets, as they go further away, um, they start to fall to the floor. The bigger ones will start to fall and um, they'll even start to evaporate because the, the, the water gets absorbed into the air. And so they it can only really go a certain distance, but, um, but they can, in some cases, hang around for, 
um, for a little while. So, um, so the goal has been to try to stop spread from the person on the left to the person on the right. And the, you know, the, the different ways that, that, that our society has approached trying to do this um, you know, are aimed at trying to stop the spread from one person to the next. So all of the social distancing um, that, uh, that, that, that we're practicing, the, the lockdowns that we're practicing, all of these are measures to try to isolate one person from the next and prevent transmission. Um, all of the, so we also have been recommended to do hand washing and, and, and sanitiz sanitizing surface areas where these droplets might have, have, have fallen. Um, and the masks that we're at, been, being asked to, to, to wear um, are, you know, another measure that, that's basically decreasing our risk of, of transmitting that virus. So the surgical mask, the um, cloth mask, um, they do a pretty good job of blocking, um, blocking these large droplets, but they don't block the, the small droplets. So they're mainly meant to, um, to contain the virus and the person that's wearing the mask. So, so it's protecting other people. Um, from you if you've been infected. Um, but all of these measures are meant to de decrease ris risk. So, um, you know, being out in, in the fresh air with lots of ventilation is much less risky than being closed up in a, in a small room um, with, with, with somebody that, that's been infected. But, but all of these are, um, you know, introduce different levels of risk of transmitting the virus from one person to the next. Um, but this is always, you know, through, through these, these respiratory um, respiratory droplets um, or, or, you know, things that uh, droplets, fresh droplets that have landed on a surface that you might have touched. And then if you touch your face or your eyes or your nose, um, you might easily spread those to, to your respiratory system. So um, it's been recommended to, you know, wash your hands um, frequently. Um, and that's meant to um, prevent transferring virus from, from surfaces or you know, other areas, you know, into your eyes or in, 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 into your nose. And um, particularly if you're wearing a mask, trying to avoid um, transferring, you know, touching your eyes or your nose when you're, when you're taking your mask on and off. So, you know, maybe taking those off by the ears is a better, better practice. But there's a lot of these sort of practices that, that the health community, um, the healthcare community um, has, uh, has practiced and knows, knows works. Um, and, uh, and, and we're trying to put in place in, you know, in, in the broader community to try to prevent transmission from, from, from one person to the next. The coronaviruses have been around for, for quite a long time. So there's um, hundreds to thousands of different types of coronaviruses out in the wild. You can find them in, in bats and birds and in cats, uh, dogs, pigs, um, uh, and, and, and obviously humans. There's also, you know, common uh, coronaviruses. So part of the common cold, there's four coronaviruses that, you know, they mainly infect the upper respiratory, respiratory tract and, you know, give you a runny nose. Um, but, uh, but this is very much different than, than the flu. Um, but these are, you know, um, different viruses that, that don't, um, don't have as big an impact as the current coronavirus that, that we're experiencing experiencing at the moment. But you know, these have been around a long time. They 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 spread in animals and and occasionally, um, as we're seeing with this pandemic, they transfer out of animals and 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 can make their way in, into human populations. So um, so you know, understanding how the, these viruses exist and 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 travel through the environment uh, is, is quite an important and ongoing um, activity and, and learning how to um, predict and anticipate and react to um, outbreaks more, more, more quickly. But the virus has a life cycle, like I said, it, it, it has to um, use your cell to make more of itself. Um, so the first step in that is, is basically binding to the outside of a cell. So um, we have uh, sort of the top here, this blue line is representing the, the outside membrane that contains the cell. Um, and the cell has receptors on the outside that, that are specific and specifically bind these spike proteins on the outside of the virus. Um, once that, that, that happens, there are mechanisms that activate the virus to be able to um, be ingested into the cell and then fuse with the cell and release its contents in, inside the cell. So um, once that happens, the, the, the viral genome 
um, starts to co-opt all of the different processes inside the cell to um, basically make more copies of itself and start to make all of the proteins that are encoded by that viral genome. Um, so just like you and me, we have, uh, humans have 20,000 different genes that make proteins and all those proteins, um, you know, in various cells in our body work together to carry out the processes inside a cell. Um, the virus has a very similar type of genome that makes proteins that have functions and, and those proteins, um, you know, they, they, they make up the structural components of the virus, but they also make up proteins that sort of interact with, with the host, um, the host proteins inside the cell. The cells, you know, your, your proteins in, inside your cell and they, they really co-opt um, and, and start to make use of di different, different types of proteins and, and molecular structures in, in your cell to um, basically manufacture more of the virus. So um, the next step is, is once those um, proteins are being made, they're um, packaged in different ways and, and, and packaged back into these mature virus particles. Um, that are then released back in back in, into into the cell. So it's thought that um, that it takes about once 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 a virus um, finds a receptor on your cell, it takes about ten minutes for that virus to make its way inside um, inside the cell and release its contents inside the cell. And it takes about another ten hours for that virus to go through the, this process of making you know many thousands to millions of copies of, of itself. Um, and then it, it, in most cases, it will kill the cell as it bursts and releases all of those, um, all of those virions in, into, um, into the surrounding space outside the cell. And those virions, those viral particles, go and start to infect other cells. And that life cycle is run over and over and over again until your immune system intervenes. Um, so there um, have been quite a few efforts to uh, find drugs that actually stop different portions of this process, different stages of the life cycle. Um, so there are, uh, these are called antiviral drugs, and there's a number of different, uh, different types of drugs that are being developed and have been developed um, and are being currently tested to, to block different stages of, of this life cycle. So you might think of different antibodies that could bind to the spike proteins and prevent them from interacting with, with the receptor. Or um, you might have heard of the convalescent serum. So um, serum and, and antibodies that have been isolated from people that have already been infected and have recovered and have mounted a good immune response, they have antibodies in their system that, uh, um, that can be injected into people that are currently undergoing disease. And um, the antibodies that have been developed towards the virus can bind and, and help block entry of the virus into the cell. Um, you can, there's also um, some clinical trials out there to try to use the soluble receptors, so free-floating receptor molecules to, uh, to bind to the virus and, and prevent it from interacting with the receptors on the surface of the cell. Um, but then there's other drugs that have been proposed to, to block sort of that, that next step of the virus being able to release its contents into, into the cell. So uh, the most famous one currently under, been, that's been in the news lately is the hydroxychloroquine. Um, this is a drug that's been around for a while to, uh, to treat malaria and, uh, and different autoimmune diseases. And it's usually used in a um, sort of a, a lower dose to, to, to accomplish that. At very high doses, it does seem to, at least in, in cell culture models and, and, and sort of the, the model systems that we have in the lab, um, it can also block um, this release of the uh, viral genome in, into the cell, but it takes really high doses to do that. And one of the problems with hydroxychloroquine is that it interacts at high doses in, in many people. It can interact with, their, with receptors in the heart that lengthen the heartbeat and can cause um, heart problems. So the, thought, the current thought, um, you know, colleagues uh, that are looking at this, um, the, the doses that you need to achieve to um, have that antiviral impact um, put a great many people at risk for developing heart problems. So, um, so there, we're looking for other, other drugs that, that, that might be able to, uh, to, 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 to accomplish that. And there are ongoing clinical trials to see if there's, there are other um, potential ways that, 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 
that particular drug might be able to be used. Um, but there are other many, many others that are um, being studied at this, at, as well. Um, the next stage of you know, using the host proteins and, and the, uh, the, the enzymes that the virus encodes to make copies of its genome, um, that, that is the target of um, remdesivir. So this is another drug that, uh, that is usually given um, by IV in, in hospitals and um, is being developed for um, being able to block the ability of the virus to replicate its genome and try to stop the viral life cycle there. Um, but there, you can think of other drugs that, that might block diff, diff, different steps, but uh, um, there's a lot of ongoing work to take existing drugs and see if we can find any that are currently useful or have been developed for other viral outbreaks in, in, in the past. And there's a lot of uh, hundreds of trials that are, that are ongoing to, um, to address that. I think we'll see um, so the outcomes of those in, in, in the coming months. Um, so one of the peculiar aspects that's making this particular virus, this particular kind of coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, um, particularly difficult to um, control is that um, after you've been infected, um, it takes about five days for you to start to see symptoms and people that, that develop symptoms, um, usually to rough, roughly about five days. Um, but the problem is that there's a period of time right before you start showing symptoms, usually roughly on about two days, where you're shedding virus and you're contagious, um, but you're not showing symptoms. So you could be walking around out seemingly um, feeling, feeling fine, but being able to, um, you know, uh, transmit and spread the, spread the virus. So um, the testing, the, the, the different tests and type of tests that are being proposed and, and are being developed and um, are currently you know, underway are aimed at trying to, you know, the, um, the tests that are used to detect the viral genome, for instance, are trying to detect um, the virus at you know, as early as, as, as possible, but that's only possible for, you know, um, until the, enough virus has been generated for you to be able to have enough in your, in, in your respiratory system that, that you can successfully harvest virus using, using a test. Um, but that critical period of a couple days before you start to show symptoms is, is, is the, one of the, the, the current problems in trying to control. And so, you know, trying to develop different testing strategies and, and isolation strategies for being able to contain outbreaks is, um, is going to be critical in allowing us to get, you know, back to, back, back to, to, back to life um, as, as normal. But if everything goes well and, and a healthy person um, that gets infected, um, once that viral, uh, those viruses start to increase, um, your immune system will discover those and start to, uh, start to develop a response. And um, they, the B cells in the immune system will start to secrete different types of antibodies, and, and those are the target of the antibody detection. And that's basically trying to detect your immune system's response to the virus if, if that's been successful. Um, so the antibody detection um, kits and, and tests that, that are currently being developed um, are aimed at trying to do that, but detect just the, corona, the, the current SARS-2 coronavirus and not other, potentially other types of virus, and try to do that, that very specifically, but also um, sensitive enough that it can detect, you know, sort of uh, early and low um, responses that, the, the, uh, you know, clinicians and, and, and health professionals are interested in, in monitoring to allow us to make decisions on how to, um, how to respond, uh, you know, as a society to be able to protect ourselves. Um, but in many people, and probably most people that uh, get infected, um, they're able to amount a, a response. And I think we're seeing, starting to see a lot of data um, come out where this seems to be true, that if, if um, you develop a um, an antibody response and contact that specifically, um, that that's a good indication that, that, uh, um, that you will at least have some period of, of immunity to being reinfected. So it appears, um, you know, data that's come out over the past few weeks is, is suggesting that if you successfully amount an antibody response, um, those antibodies seem to be protective and, and, uh, and, prevent you from being reinfected. It's still um, 
unclear how long that protection lasts. Um, you know, we know from other coronaviruses that um, they can last that that protection and other from other coronaviruses, your immune system's reaction to other coronaviruses um, can last from a year or two up to um, you know seventeen years. So the the um, one of the, the the previous SARS coronavirus outbreak, SARS one, um, that happened in two thousand three, um, there are patients that that still have. Um, Antibodies that, that are able to neutralize, you know, neutralize the, uh, the, the that particular virus. So, so it's still early days in trying to understand how long people will have immunity. But we're getting more confidence that at least um, in the near term, um, people will be immune if they've successfully mounted that immune response. Um, but one of the problems is that uh, you know, with severe cases, um, you know, we know that many people that the inner hospitals. Um, will actually go on to have a very, very severe response to, to the virus and, 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 and die from, from, that, from that response. And this seems to be primarily due, um, not exclusively, but primarily due to an overactivated immune response to, from the host um, to, to the viral infection. So your immune system has different levels of um, ways that it looks out for cells in your body. So each, each cell has its own sort of internal um, sensor system that can detect if it's been infected by a virus. And it, it will detect different pieces of that virus and, and present that virus to the immune system. And the different mechanisms that, that the cell has for responding to that virus, it will start to release different, they're called cytokines. They're basically molecules that trigger your immune response. They're the molecules that, will, for instance, um, trigger a fever or trigger um, other immune cells to, uh, to come into the infected area and start to, start to respond and try to clean up the, vi the, the, the virus in, in several different ways. Um, and it's, it's, it appears that, that SARS-CoV-2 uh, may trigger a sort of an unbalanced immune response. Um, it may respond inappropriately to, uh, to, to some of those triggers um, and in severe cases cause what's known as a, as a cytokine storm. Basically, um, your immune system your cells start to release um, lots of different types of cytokines that have lots of downstream consequences all over the body. Um, it's basically your immune system attacking almost all different cells or, and tissues in, in your body. So um, one of the big areas of, um, of interest in, in developing new therapies is trying to block that, that overactive immune response. Um, so we know in the healthy case, um, when a virus is, is infect, infects a cell, um, there are uh, ways that the cell has to try to prevent the virus from being released. Um, there are cells in the, in the lung, for instance, called, called alveolar macrophages that, that, that recognize these infected cells and will gobble them up, basically um, you know, eat, <laughs> eat the infected cell and the viruses therein. Um, the other way that the cells uh, um, act that an infected cell activates the immune system is that it calls in T cells and, and B cells that uh, um, that respond to the infected cell and these different types of B cells and T cells um, will either directly kill the infected cell or um, help the the rest of the immune system respond to respond to the virus so for instance uh, T cells will trigger um, B cells in the immune system to start producing their antibodies um, and those antibodies um, sort of over time become more and more specific uh, for, um, for, the, for the viruses, different you know, proteins on the outside of the virus or different, different proteins that the virus um, has that, 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 that's, that those, those antibodies can then bind to and in the healthy case can neutralize the, 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 the virus and block it from um, invading other cells and, and help that virus be sort of cleared by different types of cells in the immune system uh, and, 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 and clear the infection. Um, but we know that in the, um, in the severe cases that, that this doesn't quite go as planned and, and uh, the virus uh, causes a severe sort of overreaction and these cytokines that, um, you know, they, they call in, you know, sort of ex an excessive response, um, a whole lot of different cells coming in that, that attack different tissues, 
Um, it also makes your blood vessels a little bit more permeable and it might affect the way the, the, the blood clots and, and travels through, through, your, through your blood system. So there are currently, um, you know, uh, there's pre previous uh, research that, that has understood this cytokine storm and it's, it's called acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, and there have been drugs that have been developed to try to try to block this. And these are um, currently in clinical trials to uh, um, in, in patients with these severe um, responses to try to block, um, you know, block this, this overactive immune response. So one of the main um, signaling molecules that, that, that communicates this cytokine storm um, is called IL-6 and there's different antibodies and, um, and, and therapeutics that have been designed to, to block that. And you know, it's currently a molecule that uh, is used in people that uh, have autoimmune disorders. So things like rheumatoid arthritis, um, where your body's immune system is attacking your own cells. Um, this drug has been developed to try to treat that and has been very successful. So the hope is that the, um, the, the drugs that have been developed for blocking this IL-6 response um, could be helpful in the, in the severe cases. And I think we'll see um, clinical trials um, start to release, uh, uh, release data, um, hopefully demonstrating that that, 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 is, that will be an effective uh, therapy. So, you know, there's different ways that we might think about uh, uh, preventing damage caused, caused by SARS-CoV-2. Uh, um, so, you know, we, I've talked about some en existing antiviral drugs that are being developed. Um, we might think about using different combinations of those drugs. And so currently clinical trials are being planned to, uh, um, to, 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 to use combinations of, of, of those antiviral, existing antiviral drugs that, that, um, that are being repurposed. Um, but we might, in the long run, need to also develop new antiviral drugs, and we're going to need um, good um, systems for, for for being able to do that and direct drugs, new drugs to to, to this virus. Um, the other way that we want to uh, try to develop therapeutics is is to prevent this overzealous immune response to causing further damage, and then in the long run, prevent infection by uh, the use of, of vaccines and different vaccine strategies. And you know, there you've you've heard. Uh, um, at least one vaccine trials uh, that, that from Moderna uh, Therapeutics that that is uh, that started uh, uh, very early and has been uh, um, through phase one clinical trials and is starting pr to proceed uh, to proceed into the next stages of the clinical trials to further test that, that that vaccine strategy. But there are hundreds of other vaccine strategies that are that are currently being developed and 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 um, and and, and starting to enter clinical trial and testing. So what is NICEF's role in, 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 this, uh, in, in responding to, to, to this pandemic outbreak? Um, at NICEF, we, um, we use stem cells as a, as a tool, as, as a research tool to basically better understand different types of diseases. Um, and we've developed a lot of different technology um, over the years, over the past you know, 15 years, to um, be able to create stem cells from people with diseases um, and use those stem cells as tools to better understand um, how those diseases take place. And we can look at many, many hundreds to thousands of, 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 of people using their stem cells as sort of an avatar, um, a, a representation of them in the laboratory. And we've done this in, in, in different disease areas. Uh, um, we have a, a lot of uh, expertise in looking at different neurological disorders, including Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, multiple sclerosis, and, and different types of uh, psychiatric di disorders. And you know, in these cases, what we're, the way that we're using stem cells is to create cells from people that get sick. We can capture their genetics. And uh, if there's a genetic component um, to, to those diseases, we can try to tease that apart and understand the disease process by making the cells that are um, involved in those diseases and understanding by studying that process over and over in the laboratory, what's the first thing that goes wrong? And, and more importantly, how can we block that? How can we develop therapeutics to um, block that process? So for instance, in Alzheimer's disease, we can make the brain cells that are affected by the disease. In diabetes, we can make the beta cells that are the um, attacked and in, 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 and type one diabetes, um, but we use this strategy in many different ways. Um, we have other 
other ways that we use stem cells as, as, as a replacement therapy. So um, we're um, developing a, 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 a clinical approach to, for instance, treating macular degeneration and replacing the cells in the eye that are replaced. But, um, but a major focus of ours in the laboratory is being able to understand disease and use stem cells as a tool to tease that apart. And we're basically, so we're basically using this as a model system in the laboratory to represent the patient, represent you in the dish in, in, in the laboratory to understand, understand your disease. Um, the ways that the COVID-19 and the viruses, these different vir viruses, um, uh, how they work in, in cells and, and in animals, um, are, they're models in different ways. And one of the, one of the standard ways that the virologists use to understand the biology of the virus is to use um, cells uh, that are easily grown in the laboratory. So in particular, there's a, there's a current work, workhorse cell line, a cell type that's uh, used, that was discovered in the 60s that seems to be sort of capable of being infect, infected by a lot of different types of, types of virus. Um, but it has peculiar genetics that make it its response, sort of its, its inherent immune responses, um, maybe not the same as, as the response that that virus would see in a lung cell or in a, you know, in a lung cell in, in, inside a human being. Um, there are other models that, uh, that are being considered for, for studying um, SARS-CoV-2. So it turns out that the mouse uh, models um, the mouse um, ACE2 receptor actually doesn't bind uh, the SARS-CoV-2. So there's efforts to try to engineer um, mice that have human SARS, um, actually human ACE2 that, that, that can, can bind SARS-CoV-2. SARS um, another common model that's used is the ferret, um, but the, it's susceptible to infection, but it's thought that, um, at least for this particular virus, that the immune response seems to resemble that of somebody, um, sort of a mild host response, sort of a mild uh, immune response, and they recover um, from, from the viral in infection. So it's, uh, it's thought to mimic sort of what happens in most, most young people, but not all. Um, there's also a lot of work using sort of primary human cells, so cells that have been harvested from donated tissues, uh, for instance, lung cells, uh, but these are very hard to work with and, 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 and you, it's hard to study um, genetics from one person to the next to the next and really have a, a controlled system to understand that. Um, so the way that we're thinking about using stem cells to, to look at SARS-CoV-2 um, is to use stem cells as a tool to, um, to, to create the types of cells that are affected by um, and that can be infected by the virus. So, um, so we can take skin cells or blood cells, um, use a genetic trick that was discovered by Shinya Yamanaka in 2006-2007, who got the Nobel Prize a few years ago, um, to basically use a genetic trick to, to turn back the, uh, the clock on these adult cells and turn them into something that looks very much like an embryonic stem cell. So these are cells that can create all the different cell types in the body. Um, but we can make hundreds and thousands. We could fill up the entire room with, with, uh, with, with these stem cells. So they're, they're sort of an infinitely renewable resource for us to, to, to use in the laboratory. Um, but importantly, we can take those stem cells and using what we've learned from developmental biology and how the embryo makes those cells, um, turn those cells into the types of cells that can be infected by the virus. So, in, for example, we can create the very particular types of lung cells that, uh, that seem to be very um, highly infectable. And these are um, cells that have cilia on them that secrete uh, the mucus that coats the inside of your uh, lung to, 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 to keep it functioning and, 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 and healthy. Um, those seem to be the cells that are particularly vulnerable to infection. So um, in the laboratory, we're taking stem cells and turning those stem cells into these lung cells that are really particularly infectable, these um, type 2 pneumocytes that, that you see here with the little um, cilia or the little fingers sticking off. These are fingers that sort of uh, secrete mucus and, and then keep that mucus flowing to try to um, clear out you know, any particles that land in, in, in your lung in, a, in the healthy case. Um, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, it seems that once the virus um, sort of gets into the lung, those cells seem to be per particularly infectable. And not only are you infecting the cells and making more of the virus, but you're also 
um, eliminating the source of that mucus and, and that ability to clear things out of your lungs. So your lung, you get, you get a pneumonia from, from, um, from, from, from the infection. Um, so what we'd like to be able to do is use those cells to, to test um, existing drugs or find new drugs so that, that, that would prevent the infection in the first place. And then also learn how the immune system um, in those cells, the cells that we can derive from the stem cells, um, respond to that, to the infection, and infection of those cells around them. And in particular, we can make uh, not only individual cell types, but even little lung organoids. These are little, um, little mini tissues that have the different cell types in, in, you know, in those little, little organoids that, uh, that we can use to a little bit better mimic um, the, the tissue that we would find, find in the body. Um, so uh, not only lung cells, but, but we can make organoids from a lot of different types of tissues. So uh, th these are sort of examples from um, one of our collaborators at uh, Weill Cornell, Shui Bing Chen, um, has developed uh, organoids from lots of different types of tissues. Uh, and she's looked at, studied 10 different types of tissues to date and, and has found that in the tissues that express the receptor, those are um, seem to be susceptible to infection by SARS-CoV-2 and indeed may actually be even um, better able to mimic uh, the viral life cycle and, and take advantage of the, the, those cells compared to the standard um, cell line and, and tissue culture models that have been traditionally used by, by, by virologists. So we're seeing that, that these organoids can be very valuable tools for, um, for virologists and our collaborators to be able to use um, to understand how the virus works. So, you know, we think that, that stem cells can be a very effective tool for, mo for helping model viral infection, um, for understanding how the virus affects different types of cells, um, and then also using um, the, these um, tools to uh, test drugs. So, um, uh, for instance, uh, Shui Bing has, has used these organoid systems and, and stem cell derived cell types to screen through sort of known existing drugs and has found uh, many that seem to be able, uh, able to um, block infection. And these are drugs that have you know, been, uh, been through clinical trials already and, and can be repurposed hopefully um, for, um, for use in the, in the clinic. And there are active um, efforts to start to pull those into clinical trials to see how well they're gonna work in, in, in people. Um, as we saw from the experience with hydrochloroquine, Hydrochloroquine that uh, um, you know often what we find in the laboratory may not translate to to humans. So it's going to be really important to have ways of narrowing down the number of drugs that we want to study um, to be able to take those into clinical trials most quickly. Um, but we also want to study how different individuals might react to the virus differently. So each of us is different, and our our the genes that that, that we have are are, you know, just have subtle differences that make, might make us more or less susceptible to infection. Um, so there are different efforts to try to understand that process as well. Um, we have collaborators uh, um, from a, a number of different um, groups and a number of different collaborations and consortia that have been assembled around the world and indeed actually got started, started very early. So for instance, um, Sumit Chandra uh, at uh, Sanford Burnham um, started uh, very early in January, um, trying to screen through um, this compound library called the Reframe Library. And it's basically an existing set of um, compounds that are currently in the clinic. that are investigational drugs. They've been some. They they have we have experience of how those those drugs react to people in the clinic. We know their safety profiles and, and that sort of thing. Um, they found thirty existing drugs that that seem to have antiviral properties that that we're collaborating to try to understand better. How, how those, um, which one of those might be best to take into, into clinical trials. Um, as another set of collaborators, um, uh, um, Nevin uh, Krogan at, at, uh, and others, uh, basically all around the world and, and groups here at Mount Sinai in New York, um, have taken a different approach and, and looked at the host proteins that are inside the cell that interact with the viral proteins. And they've done some really advanced modeling to, to predict different drugs that might interact with um, and block interactions between those viral proteins and, and the host proteins that they, that they interact with. But that means that um, our viral, our host genetics might 
uh, make us respond differently to some of the drugs that are developed. So we're trying to you know, use our um, resources to best, better understand those drug targets and, and how our differing genetics might make um, that drug development pro process um, go run more, more, more efficiently. Um, so we're also interested in sort of what are the long-term consequences of having been infected with, with SARS-CoV-2. Once you've recovered, um, you know, we're tr also trying to understand, you know, um, how the different, you know, chronic diseases that, that, that we um, currently study in the laboratory, um, how people with those diseases might be impacted by the virus. Are there going to be long-term neurological impacts? Um, are people with diabetes, which we know that the virus can infect beta cells in the pancreas, are people with diabetes going to be infected, affected in the long term? Um, but in I said, we're, so we're well positioned just to, to work with collaborators to understand how these sort of underlying conditions that are comorbidities and in, in, in the reaction to, to SARS-CoV-2. Um, using our stem cell models, we, we hope to, to collaborate with these um, groups to, to, to better understand the long-term consequences to infection. So there's an enormous community at NICEF and, and a number of collaborators that, that, that we're working with and have been working with for, for months now to, uh, to um, address the, the, the pandemic. We have a great group um, uh, internally at NICEF, a small team that's been working um, uh, diligently to, to, to make this happen. Um, but uh, we have many investigators um, in our community and, and uh, many of them, some of whom I've talked about already, um, we're developing, developing different strategies to address the pandemic from creating better testing strategies to um, therapeutics, uh, antibodies that might better block um, disease, and then also ways of tracking and, and, and being able to, to, to respond to disease. Um, we're collecting uh, and telling their stories at this link, um, nicef.org COVID-19, and and we'll post this in, 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 in the chat. Um, if you follow that, you'll find the stories of these different investigators and, and how they're approaching the, uh, the, 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 the virus as, as well. Um, so you know, we're, we're excited about uh, the, the potential for um, you know, working with many collaborators around the world to better understand and develop therapeutics for, uh, for addressing this pandemic and getting us back to, to uh, as close to normal as we can possibly get very soon. So with that, uh, you know, I think we'll, we'll transition over to taking questions. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, I think we have, a, we have a lot of questions, so I want to jump right into them. Um, first, there was one from Mason um, asking, you mentioned the receptor ACE2 is the way that um, the virus is able to get into lung cells. Could you talk about what, what its normal role is when it's not acting as sort of this doorway for the virus? Yeah, so, so the ACE2 receptor is found on a lot of different cells and it's actually an enzyme itself and it's involved in a homeostatic system um, that, that um, maintains, uh, um, maintains your blood system and your, your blood volume. So it, main it maintains blood pressure and, and so not only is the virus using that as a entry mechanism, but once the virus infects the cell and, and um, it, it actually takes a lot of that ACE2 receptor off of, off of the cells that it infects. And so the overall amount actually goes down. So um, one of the thoughts is that, uh, um, and there's a group that's been studying this for a long time, that um, in the lung in particular, um, once the virus infects the cells in the lung and, and the ACE2 goes away, it seems to make the lung particularly susceptible to, to damage and attack. Um, so the strategy and one of the clinical strategies that's being um, pursued in clinical trials at the moment is to actually use the soluble ACE2 um, that maintains that enzymatic activity that's being able to regulate that, 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 uh, that damage process, um, both to block the viral entry but also return ACE2 back to normal levels to help um, improve lung damage. But that's good. It's a, a good question. It's, it's, a, it's a peculiar um, receptor that, that this particular coronavirus uses and it, that may be leading to um, a lot of the severe damage that we're seeing. Great. Thanks so much. Um, there is another question from Tamar. 
um, regarding the existing drugs that have been identified that have been effective in, in stopping effect, infection um, you know, by testing cells in a dish, could you talk a little bit more about those and, and, and which ones might be the, the sort of top or most effective candidates in the pipeline right now? Yeah, so, um, so there's some different, different candidates. So there's you know, at least three different groups that have, have done screens to try to find existing, uh, existing compounds. Um, and uh, these um, different groups have come up with lists of you know, 30 to 50 to 60 um, of their sort of top hits that are able to block um, entry of the virus or some, block some stage of the viral life cycle. And in these screens, um, drugs like remdesivir, um, you know, drugs that seem to be um, hopeful in the clinic at the moment have popped up in these drug screens. But some of the other ones are ones that hadn't previously been considered. So um, there's a drug compound called Gleevec that's used in the clinic for um, uh, for, for, for treating different type, types of, of, of cancer. Um, the Shri Bing Chen has identified that, um, that that may be useful in blocking um, some stage of the viral, viral life cycle. So I believe Sloan Kettering and maybe some other groups are starting to um, put together clinical trials for, for that one in particular. But, the, but there are a number of others that, um, that are also being looked at. There's um, I think some over 100, maybe close to 400 different clinical trials that are ongoing or being started at the moment trying to look at these different drugs. But one of the one of the issues is is trying to narrow down, you know, which which of those you know lists to actually pursue first. So, um, you know, we, we know that not a, not all the drugs that that show promise in cell culture in the lab are going to actually be useful when they make their way into the clinic. Um, and you know, a lot of that might have to do with dosing or how well that drug might be available to the different tissues in the body that might be susceptible to infection. Um, so a lot of these drugs are, are still going to have to go through the clinical trials and you know, the randomized controlled trials to um, understand whether or not there, there's, go there's going to be a uh, you know, positive impact, but uh, but those are ongoing and many many started already. So hopefully, over the next couple of months, we'll start to see um, see the results of those trials come come through, and and we have high hope that that um, as, you know several of those are you know um, will will actually succeed. And I think one of the, the other um, uh, one of the other ideas that that um, is being actively pursued is the um, this idea of combining uh, different antivirals, um, even ones that might not be perfect or, or really great, you, if you, when you, you start combining them into cocktails, much like as what has been done for, for HIV, um, the, the, together those cocktails might be more effective. But really, I think the, the goal is to try to find something that can be broadly um, distributed and made broadly available um, to, uh, to 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 be able to catch catch the virus early, um, but we also need 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 drugs that are that, that are safe in, in, in people as well um, to be able to you know distribute these broadly and understand their effects in the population. Absolutely, that's so critical. Um, there is another question um, if about uh, the stem cell research that we're doing to understand the virus. Could you elaborate a little bit more on how stem cell models can? be used to understand who is more susceptible to these severe cases, who might be a bit more protected by virtue of their genetics? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, one, of the, one of the peculiar um, outcomes of, of, of these infections is that there's you know, people in the population that seem to be healthy and you would not necessarily expect to have severe responses or sort of an overreaction to, to, to this particular viral infection. And it's thought that those people might have um, a genetic makeup that makes them more susceptible to being, being infected or, or makes them more susceptible to that over um, active exuberant immune response. And if you remember that the virus, you know, it doesn't have everything it needs to work. It has to interact with different proteins in your body. So you know, our colleagues, for instance, at, at, at UCSF and, and the consortium around the world um, look, looked at um, and found uh, over 300 different proteins in, in our cells that 
actually physically interact with the viral proteins. Um, those interactions are, um, you know, they're, they're driven by the shapes of the proteins and your genes control different subtle differences in the, in the shape of those proteins. So, um, so you might think that, okay, if I have a viral protein that's stuck to one of the host proteins and that complex is responsible for replicating the viral genome, um, if I find a drug that could block that interaction, I might be able to prevent the virus from replicating its genome and making more of itself. Um, that drug has to interact with those shapes and those proteins. And because our genomes control the, 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 sh the, the shapes of, of those proteins, they, that, that information is contained in our genome, our differing genetics might you know, make those drugs make more work better or worse in, in different people. So, um, so uh, we're working with these groups to um, you know, identify the genes that are, that are the, the, those host proteins that encode those host proteins that interact with the viral proteins um, and create stem cell lines that carry those genetics. And then we can then create the cell types that are infected and understand how those different subtle changes might affect the ability of those drugs that have been identified to work in different people. And so you could imagine coming up with a genetic profile of, of a drug combination that's particularly suited to your genetic makeup versus another in the long run. So we're actively trying to pursue um, with different groups uh, um, this idea of, of using the stem cells to study the population that's going to be taking these drugs. You know, how do different people respond to these different drugs and, and, and viral infections? So, you know, stem cells capture our genetics. So we're taking advantage of that tool to um, explore genetics as it you know, impacts the ability of these drugs to, uh, to, to work or not, or better or worse. Okay, great. Um, so unfortunately, I'm going to have to ask one final question. We did have a lot that, uh, that came in, so we do apologize we couldn't get to everyone. Um, but I'm hoping to touch on a couple of different topics in this final one. One is, um, you know, sort of what, what makes you both, and this is to you, Susan, as well, what makes you both um, most hopeful about the uh, opportunities that stem cells create um, for us to tackle this pandemic? And, and where do you see NICEF's role in, in working with, um, with these collaborators, all of these um, great scientists all over the world who have uh, jumped on board um, to address these problems? So, uh, so I would say, I mean, NICEF's uh, role has really been as a catalytic uh, role and also as a convener. So I think um, both with the technology that, um, that we have, with uh, our expertise in making um, very advanced human models, uh, I think it's no wonder that um, all of these collaborators have actually reached out um, to us to, to ask if uh, we'll get involved because we then can take the knowledge that we have um, manipulating cells to uh, uh, address the underlying conditions that Scott mentioned, so uh, all of the neurological components to it, um, the, uh, the you know, um, immunological uh, components to it uh, in our work with, uh, with diabetes uh, and uh, cardiac response. Um, and so I, I do feel very optimistic. I mean, everyone is really, really focused on COVID. Um, now, we have to also make sure that we, uh, that we still have uh, funding and attention and, and people to be working on those underlying causes because, uh, you know, cancer, diabetes, uh, MS, Alzheimer's is not going away because we have COVID, sadly. It's not like we fix COVID and we fix everything else. So uh, it just it creates a, uh, an overlayer. Um, but, uh, you know, our mission is, uh, is to um, find uh, cures and uh, way better treatments uh, for people who are suffering. And, uh, you know, COVID is something that, we, that affects every part of our lives. You know, we don't talk about the emotional part uh, in, uh, in this webinar, uh, you know, the economic part. But um, telling everybody to just stay home uh, for the next 18 months um, is really not uh, something that um, is, is, is viable. Although everybody, please wash your hands and wear those masks. That's really key. Scott, what do you... Uh... I, I, th I think I'm most, what I'm most encouraged by is the response of the scientific community to the pandemic and basically breaking down very quickly many barriers to working together and coming together into large consortia to use all of our different expertise to try to address different aspects of, 
of trying to find you know treatments and cures and, and therapies and and eventually a vaccine for um, for um, the tools that are going to be necessary for us to return back to to, to, to normal life, but the enthusiasm that, that my colleagues and, and people around the world, uh, different researchers around the world um, have shown in, in coming together to, um, to address this disease has been very, very encouraging for me. And so, you know, I look forward to, to you know, working more aggressively with all of them to, to try to find ways to, um, to, to blocking and, and blocking the virus and, and treating it and returning people back to health. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's a, it, this is, there's nothing like a, uh, you know, an emergency um, pandemic to, uh, to make everybody really focus on coming together uh, and, um, you know, take a lot of the, the competitive energy that they have uh, and, and put it into competing against the drug as opposed uh, against the disease, as opposed to uh, competing with each other. Um, so uh, I just want to uh, say um, thank you to everybody who joined. Uh, you will all receive an email uh, tomorrow with more information about the efforts you heard about today, um, as well as those from, uh, from other members of the NICIF community. Um, this work is so important. Uh, uh, we all know that. Uh, at NICIF, uh, we really would appreciate uh, any support as we navigate the challenges of ta tackling uh, COVID-19, uh, which, you know, sort of blew up in January and uh, has taken over a lot of budgets, uh, in addition to the ongoing work on the diseases that uh, now are presenting as underlying conditions um, and will continue to affect patients uh, even after the pandemic. Thank you. Have a great day. Wash your hands a lot. That really matters. Um, and wear those masks when you go outside. But, uh, but do go outside uh, and just be socially distant. Um, but uh, it's, it's important to take care of that part of ourselves too. Uh, be well and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you all. Be well.